besties. Welcome or welcome back to the Gamer's Hearth podcast. I am so happy to be talking to you today. Before we start, I want to acknowledge and apologize for the fact that the episodes have been a little bit irregular. I know that makes it difficult for y'all to anticipate when I'm going to have new episodes. It has just been a little bit of a crazy past couple weeks. I've had my birthday. I've had some various issues and things like that. I won't go into all of it, but it's going to get better. I promise. Thank you for sticking with me and thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's episode, I'm having a conversation with the absolutely amazing RF Joe all about the Southeast Asian gaming landscape. It was so much fun and I'll be introducing y'all to him in just a minute, but before we get started, let's talk about the cozy gaming news from this week. There's not a ton going on, so it's gonna be a little bit short. On April 22nd, Tales of the Shire released their trailer, which is very, very exciting. And they gave us an idea of what the game is basically going to be about. So as many of us suspected, this is a cozy life sim that takes place in the Shire. Something along the lines of like Animal Crossing, Crossing, Paleo, in those veins. We also got an idea of what the main objective of the game is going to be. They talk about how the goal of the game is going to be to throw an amazing party for the community, which I think is so perfect. Those big Hobbit parties are such an important part of Hobbit culture, so I think that's really, really cool. One thing that I wonder is if that is the main objective of the game, to throw this big party, then does that mean that the game has an end? Is it going to end at that point, or is it going to be something more similar to to the community center in Stardew Valley, for example, where you have that overarching objective that you're working toward, but then when you complete it, you still have meaningful open-ended play. We'll have to see about that, but we did get a look at what some of the gameplay is gonna be like. They showed us some of the activities that you can do. There's fishing, foraging, cooking, decorating, throwing dinner parties. It seems like the ultimate cozy, relaxing game. People are a little bit divided on the art of the game, particularly the character designs. Many are saying that the graphics seem outdated. They don't like the style but other people like it just fine. I personally am not a huge fan of the graphics. I think the environments look pretty, but like many others, I'm not super excited about the way that the characters look. However, it is far from anything that is going to keep me from absolutely devouring this game when it comes out. Plus, the footage that they showed was still in alpha, so there's plenty of time for them to tweak things, polish things, and I'm sure that will happen. Okay, so I have the honor of introducing Arif Johan. Arif is a content creator from Malaysia who is covering the South Southeast Asian games ecosystem. He hosts a recurring live stream on Twitch called Southeast Asia Nights, where he works with regional developers and publishers to showcase indie titles from the region with a goal of celebrating Southeast Asian voices. He's also the co-host of the 20M podcast, which is a show that covers everything from indie games to AAA titles, spanning game reviews, live streams, developer interviews, and more. RF and I have been mutuals for a while, and I have admired his work so much, and so it was such an honor and a joy to get to chat with him about all things Southeast Asian games. Let's go. Arif, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's so good to chat with you and get to talk to you about amazing Southeast Asian games. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for inviting me on the podcast. I am honored. You know, I'm blessed. I'm honored to be on here. Um, and I think for me, like, it's like I've been following your content for quite a while. I think it's almost like been like, what, two years at this point? Just yeah. Like general been... mutuals over like Twitter-ish. Like, yeah, yeah I think I, I consume a lot of your TikTok. Content, so I am just honored to be here. I'm excited to talk about like some wholesome, some cozy, some like Southeast Asian games. Yes. Yes. Um, I am definitely honored as well to be talking to you. It's so cool. Um, so if you could just start by telling us a little bit about you and your work and, and what you do, the realm that you're in, in gaming content. Yeah, so like, uh, I guess for those that don't know me, my name is Arif, I am a Malaysian-based content creator. Uh, and my whole shtick for the past three, almost like four years at this point has been covering Southeast Asian games. So those are independent games made in countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Singapore, the Philippines, you know, the surrounding areas as well. Um, because when I started, uh, wanting to get into content and especially games content, I realized that there were a lot of amazing games that came from the region that people in the region didn't even know uh, were from here. So I kind of mm. wanted to make sure that my content kind of like um, shared with the world that there are amazing games being made here in Southeast Asia. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that I did 
uh, for the past couple of years has been streaming Southeast Asian games and working with independent developers to showcase those games, tweet about those games, talk about those games, and talk about the developers behind them. Uh, and then recently, I started a podcast with my co-host uh, Sam called the 20M Podcast, and that's a show where we not only cover uh, indies to AAA, but we also make sure to interview um, the folks behind games as well. So community managers, developers, artists, and uh, give a voice to the people that are behind games, uh, all with the goal of uh, making sure that our you know, story and our angles are all through a Southeast Asian lens. In terms of content, a lot of the stuff that I do is actually on Twitter. So I got a lot of uh, my start just tweeting about independent games as well. Um, and then obviously meeting a bunch of mutuals in the game dev scene through there. Uh, so, you know, despite the turbulence of that platform as well, a lot of my content and coverage is on Twitter. I mean, like, for example, yesterday, um, a Malaysian developer uh, or they're part Malaysian, they're half Malaysian, I guess. Um, they're, they made a game called Rhythm Doctor and they just got awarded mm. uh, an award at GDC. So it's just like, you know, Ooh. saw that, quickly tweeted about that, like, hey, yeah. everybody, this is like a Malaysian-based team. Like, please celebrate this kind of stuff. Okay, speaking of Twitter, I have to ask, I saw on your Twitter, did you play, you played D&D &D with Larian? Is that what I saw <laughs> yes. on your Twitter? Wait, okay, first of all, most of my content eventually turns to Baldur's Gate 3, so this is perfect, but can you tell me about that? That was that was so cool. Like, how did that happen? Yeah, but no, I mean, that's a, that's a hilarious one because it's like, it's such a throwaway. It's not even related to my content. I was just invited to a, it's it was kind of like a closed door D&D &D session with the Larian mm -hmm. Studios team. So for those that don't know, again, and this is my whole thing with the Southeast Asian region, we not, we not only have like amazing independent developers here, but we also have a lot of AAA folks that have set up shop. So Larian mm -hmm. Studios, one of their uh, main offices is also in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, that's also like pretty close by to where I live. So I know they held a tiny grassroots, hey, play D&D &D with Larian Studios. Uh, and it was awesome, you know, just... Uh, so cool. Yeah, sitting next to the guy who wrote Asterian's voice lines, <laughs> like in the, it's kind of like here in Malaysia. It's kind of like a. Uh, it just reminds you that like games are not made in a vacuum. Games are not made yeah. in just one part of the world, especially when it gets to that scale. Like it's mm -hmm. truly a Herculean international effort to get things like Baldur's Gate out there to to the world. The people who work for Larian are they the writers? Are they a mix of different? Yeah. Are they artists? Like what? Or, or is it just a mix of different folks with different specialties? Yeah, I think like the best way to describe at least the Southeast Asian region is that for the most part, we've kind of been like a outsourcing uh, art uh, hub, if you will. So a lot okay. of the assets that go into a lot of AAA games go through a lot of the uh, studios here in Southeast Asia. So okay. I think it started with the Philippines. There's a couple in Indonesia as well. And there's um, predominant ones here in Malaysia, uh, whereby most of the AAA games that would be shipped out, I know that's probably hyperbolic, I don't know about the actual stats behind it, right? But they would have these studios from Southeast Asian countries contributing to like art assets, you know? Oh, okay. Um, and then recently, I think just because of the game development scene, like those companies have, uh, you know, are huge now. There are hundreds of people strong in each company um, throughout the region. Then I think the games ecosystem also developed uh, alongside that over here. Oh, so okay, now okay. I think studios are starting to uh, have a couple more folks that are not just exclusively doing arts, but mm. like you said, kind of doing some of the writing stuff, some of the uh, game design, et cetera, et cetera. So it looks yeah. like um, people are just trying to hire internationally a little bit more. But also like the side note from that is like, you're also seeing some amazing independent developers pop up mm -hmm. as of late because of the I guess just increase in games uh, presence here in Southeast Asia or the spotlight yeah. that Southeast Asia has had so yes like amazing devs across the board whether they be an indie and AAA here in uh, here in Southeast Asia that have done amazing work and have yet to mm -hmm. do like even better work is, yeah. what I, is what I'm like thinking. I also want to know just a little bit about your own personal experience with gaming. What, you know, when did you start playing games? Were you a kid or did you start playing games later in life? And, and what, what's, what's your kind of history with games? I'm like tried and true. Like the first thing that I ever did was play, <laughs> play video games. Nice. My, uh, my intro one was always like, I think it was the SNES. Like I would play with my nice. dad. Like Donkey Kong Country is one of my favorite games of all time. Super mm -hmm. I think the SNES was Super Mario brothers three super mario world it doesn't matter somebody's gonna remember. correct me somebody's gonna correct me in the comments um, <laughs> but the snes was my first but like i really fell in love with uh and i've been talking about this game so often in the past like couple uh couple of weeks but zoo tycoon was like a major one for me mm -hmm. so you know Z like, everybody else was playing roller coaster tycoon and then i got my hands on zoo tycoon with a couple friends and then that has been like uh my <laughs> intro to games and funny enough there's a southeast asian dev 
um, who made somewhat of like a spiritual successor to a uh, zoo tycoon called Let's Build a Zoo. So they're based oh, in Singapore. Yeah. But it's like it's on Game Pass now, and it's it's literally everything I wanted. I just uh, I've, I've just been playing it the past couple of weeks. Uh, nice. But yeah, and then like you know, uh, the other love of my life is Kingdom Hearts. So oh my Kingdom God. Hearts really brought me into this like just world of magic and disney and yes. also final fantasy so all of those yes. things combined it's like it's about friendship it's about like just happiness it's also about despair and darkness but at the same time the triumph of light so my entire personality i feel like is uh, you know hanged upon <laughs> kingdom hearts and all I the games love, associated i love that okay and then I, I have to ask this what games are you playing right now what's on your rotation currently oh my god i the only thing that i want to again shout at the top of my lungs is is that I um, have been playing this amazing game on mobile, which is like a really big shock to me because I don't usually play too many mobile games or like actively play mobile games. But uh, I've tweeted about this like six times at this point. But I <laughs> there's this uh, game from the Philippines. Um, it's a solo dev. And uh, she developed this game called a, uh, Window Garden. And it's just like Ooh. an idle, lo-fi, kind of like decorate your... Uh, windowsill if you will with a bunch of plants uh, and yeah. every day you log in and you just water your plant you just like give it a little like beads like, like sun things i guess to make sure that they're i don't know photosynthesizing i don't know what, I don't know what <laughs> plants do um eating but <laughs> yeah exactly plant, it's like i'm feeding eat. the sun to like to these little guys uh, and i love it it's just like it's so beautiful because the art direction is amazing the music is amazing and to me it's just like again one of those mind-blowing things where that's some amazing talent coming from southeast asia but also a solo dev like a, a just a singular dev who made that game um it just launched on ios so please go like just download the heck out of that one like that one has been on my like daily rotation nice. literally like logging in every day to play that one how did you get started in content creation what made you decide that you wanted to create content and then content about the southeast asian um ecosystem yeah specifically? I, I think i alluded to this like earlier but the way that i always describe it was um just like everybody else who's probably got started in content over the past three or four years it's the pandemic like yeah. locked us Same. up all <laughs> in the room and it's like we i was just trying to find an avenue to tap into some creative stuff that i could do mm -hmm. here and i definitely wanted to uh, start twitch because i think that's what also when twitch started to become like super super big especially in my circle of friends and whatnot but then i was like okay look i'll start twitch and i tried it a little bit i, I called some friends to play some multiplayer games with me and just start, test out the platform made sure i wasn't talking to a wall at like two followers or whatever um but then i started to realize there was like a larger mission behind how i could use that platform and this came after i I came back to uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and went to a conference, like a developer conference called Level Up KL. It's like part mm -hmm. consumer, part developer, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walked around Level Up KL, and I saw like booths of independent games made in Southeast Asia. And some of them were, again, mind-blowingly good. And I was like, I had no idea these games were being made in my like backyard, basically. Mm -hmm. And then if I like felt like that, I was like, why doesn't the world kind of uh, get exposed to these kinds of games too? So then I was like, okay, well, if I want to do something on Twitch, I want to do something a little bit more different. I want to have like a little bit of a, a, a different angle. But at the same time, uh, I feel like I'm really passionate about bringing culture here to the rest of the world. So mm -hmm. I started with this project called... Mal like I think it was called like a Malaysia Day stream event or whatever. So during our Independence Week ish, I chose three games that were made here in Malaysia, and then uh, streamed them just to test out how uh, how it would be received. Um, and there's some amazing games that I streamed. I think one of them was uh, No Straight Roads as well by Metronomic, and those are like X Square devs, X, X Capcom devs that are Malaysian who came back from Japan. Uh, to Malaysia to start their own ind indie studio. Uh, oh, so that cool. game is flipping phenomenal. And I, that one, I think we streamed right when that one came out. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, it kind of just cascaded where I started to, to feel like that idea was really cool to showcase some Southeast Asian games to the rest of the world. And then I reached out to a couple of developers um, because there were some also some awesome releases coming out around that time frame. And one thing led to another. It like just started this whole project called Southeast Asian Nights. And I think to date, and I, I haven't, you know that project is hasn't been super active over the past like year or so but i think at the at the latest point we've worked with about 16 plus developers so mm -hmm. from indonesia thailand philippines malaysia but yeah just to showcase these games uh folks on on twitch i feel like 
when I was introduced to your work, and I, I don't remember exactly the origins no of idea. like how we no became idea. mutuals. I feel like you came. I think I was like streaming Coral Island at one time, and you like came into my stream oh, or something. Oh, that could have been hundred percent. That could have been it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what it was. But anyways, I through following your work, I realized just how many of the games that I already loved were from Southeast Asia. And I realized like, oh my God, so many of these amazing indie games that are so well loved, um, like Potion Permit and um, Coffee Talk, Coral Island, ex like even more, we, we could talk more later, but like so many come from Southeast Asia. And I was like, wow, that's like, that's really, really cool. And I, and I, and I, I realized that through the work that you do, like your tweets and, and stuff like that. So <laughs> the game that got me really motivated was coffee talk, because I think that mm -hmm. year that coffee talk came out, it was nominated at the dice awards for yeah. uh, best independent game. If I'm mm -hmm. uh, one of those, I forgot what exactly the title was, but it was up against Hades basically, right? Like that's the quality of like yeah. game that coffee talk is and everybody around the world kind of like uh, knows it. But yeah. I remember like even these days, like when I'm talking to my friends, I'm like, Hey, you know, coffee talk is, made by an Indonesian developer, right? And they're like, no, I had no idea. And it's like, that is the most heartbreaking thing for me because Southeast Asians, I know we love like, again, shouting at the top of our lungs whenever our countries get represented in some way, shape or form, whether it be movies or whether it be like sports or whatever. But yeah, it's just so weird. There are like massive hit games that are coming out here that people just don't realize that are coming from this region. And I guess like that's where my work was like trying to change that narrative a little bit more. But I think now yeah. people are kind of, kind of aware that some great games are coming out from this region yeah definitely so when you say people aren't aware do you mean people in southeast asia aren't aware of the games that are coming out in that area or do you mean like globally or both yeah i think like before and i always like shared this story but i remember when um i was chatting with like media friends like three years ago right so all the folks that run uh, some of the international like sites that are present here, but also some um, some other local publications. And I, this general sentiment would be like nobody really cares about like regional, like if they do a piece on a local game, for example, mm -hmm. it it's not as lucrative or it's not it, the clicks don't really come through, right? Like that's a general oh, sentiment. Okay. And I think over the past couple years, number one, like the excitement from the region, like when people say Southeast Asia, people kind of know the countries that are associated um, mm -hmm. a little bit more now so than before. Um, but then the second thing is that like, I think with the explosion of the number of game studios that have popped up, like there's built in excitement already um, and the games that have been released too. So I just remember when like nobody was covering Southeast Asian games in the region here. Now almost every single like um, regional publication would cover uh, Southeast Asian games. Um, so. Nice it's just such a beautiful kind of like trajectory to, to see that. Like I literally remember Virtual Southeast Asia was one of the only publications that was covering uh, uh, indie games from the region. And Andreas, you know, wonderful friend uh, is continuing to do that work. But yeah, IGN Southeast Asia would have like one or two articles uh, and they were great, all written by uh, also friends of mine. But yeah, it would just be like, now everybody's writing about Southeast Asian games and it's beautiful. Uh, so nice. it is regional, but it's also like globally, I feel like, not that it's important for people to know where games come from per se, because at the end of the day, the games should speak for themselves and those stories and those experiences should mm -hmm. resonate with players regardless. But it just seems like, um, I don't know, developer, uh, it seems like publishers are eyeing the region a little bit more. They're, act they're actively participating in some of the regional conferences, um, international publishers uh, in particular. Yeah, I don't know. I just think there's a growing sentiment overseas too to scout out some games from the region here because of the hits that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. I have to bring it back to social media. I, yeah, it always it. comes back. How do you think social media has played a role in the general awareness of Southeast Asia as a gaming hub i mean it's just a it's a beautiful tool to get people connected despite its uh you know ups and downs but my okay. story with social media is that without like me covering stuff on twitter or reaching out or seeing some of the early games that i saw on twitter i wouldn't have like the I wouldn't have been able to do any of the opportunities that I have done over the past couple of years, right? So I want to give like some major love to people like uh, Sarah from Tokyo Productions. So she was originally, I, I can't remember what she was when I reached out to her, but like community manager, she was the first ever dev I reached out to to like collaborate. Nice. Uh, and now I think she's head of marketing for Toge and Toge is one of those household names behind, you know, Coffee Talk, A Space for the Unbound, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, but like, you know, she really champions, she and a bunch of other people like in her circle really champion, like it, it takes a village 
village to build this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And when you're a developer friend in Southeast Asia and you get connected with another developer friend, it's about supporting each other's games. So you often yeah. see a lot of other Southeast Asian devs tweet about other Southeast Asian devs and kind of say like, hey, this is from another part of Indonesia. It's like, oh, hey, this one's also from, this one's from Malaysia. Or it's like, hey, we see a Thai game out there. Let's tweet and retweet and all that kind of stuff. Like our countries are small. Our countries are, you know, some of them more developed than others, uh, especially when it comes to the games ecosystem. Like there's a lot of major development in, you know, Singapore has like Riot, Hoyaverse, like um, I know the Facebook gaming team was out there as well. And like they, they just mm -hmm. have so much more of the upper funnel kind of development side of things. Malaysia has like maybe a half of those and then also like a thriving indie ecosystem. But I think everybody realizes that like we can't do this alone if we're in the region. So yeah. and our cultures, not to say that they're super similar, but we travel everywhere here in Southeast Asia, right? Like it's not weird to, um, you know, be familiar with Bangkok when you're living in Jakarta, right? Mm -hmm. Or Kuala Lumpur when you're living in Singapore, obviously, or, uh, you know, Manila or whatever have you. So like, it's just one of those things where like uh, people who champion building each other up on social media is the reason why I think a lot of Southeast Asian games are getting recognized, but also like, um, uh, yeah, creators, media, like this entire ecosystem i'm not gonna say it's perfect but it's one of those super cool like tightly more tightly knit communities that i've seen um than than other regions of the world so i watched a panel that you did um for ludo Naricon last year where you interviewed um you had a panel of some developers that are based in southeast asia and one thing that i really noticed um, when I was watching that is how strong of a sense of place the developers had. They felt very, you know, tied um, to the region and it really influenced their work in a lot of different ways. So I was wondering if you could kind of speak to the ways that the various cultures of the region can kind of influence the games that are being made there. That's a, that's a super fascinating one. I also want to give the caveat by saying like, Although I may work with devs in like some capacity, I'm not a dev, right? right so right. like the dev, the dev kind of stuff. Like, please consult your local devs and like uh, reach out to them, or even the ones that are in Southeast Asia. I think they have a lot more to say for me. But I think my takeaway in covering Southeast Asian games and speaking with a lot of devs throughout the region is like, there's always an excitement to infuse our culture in the games that like we build, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's been a fascinating one because some of them slap you in the face with it where it's like, hey, this game is set in Southeast Asia. It's going to be a Southeast Asian culture. It's going to be mm -hmm. about Southeast Asian topics. Um, and then others kind of weave it a little bit more slyly. Like, I think one of the games that I wanted to bring up in that aspect is, I mean, Coral Island, I think, does it pretty masterfully, where it's like, you mm -hmm. can't really tell it's an Indonesian game, but if you are from the region or if you're Indonesian, the, the second man you meet is an Indonesian man. Like, it's just so objectively, like, obvious. Um, or uh, Petite Island as well, um, coming from mm -hmm. Bali by Zello Games. Like, I think they're uh, integrating a little bit more, like, architecture and concept, like background art that are more familiar to the region. But I think all that to say, like, I think uh, us in the region always want to be proud of like the culture and we don't see a lot of our region or the things that we're familiar with represented uh, mm -hmm. in games. So I think there's that need to kind of push that out there. But yeah, there's this aspect of like, e e again, not to say again that cultures are super similar throughout Southeast Asia, but right. there was one example that I always reference, which is uh, a space for the Unbound before they even launched, when they were doing just really, really early marketing. They just posted a, uh, a GIF of um, your character walking from left to right, but they couldn't access the back road. And it's one of those game design things where it's like, oh, we don't want players to access the back road yet. So how how we're going to block the back road is to add a street wedding, which is basically where like over here in Southeast Asia, super common in a lot of countries to just like set up tarps and canopies on the street for like a wedding that's happening in a household next door. Right. And oh, it's like, oh, wow. well, I guess that that road is blocked for this day. Like, we'll just go around it. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. So, yeah. Like that is a thing where it's like, although that's an Indonesian game, although that's like a super niche, like, I don't know who's going to get that reference. Not in Southeast Asia. Everybody in Southeast Asia is like, oh, my God, that's so smart. That's exactly <laughs> how you interlace game design and, uh, you know, social kind of like psychological mechanics, if you will. In yeah, game design, yeah. In a way that's cultural. The sense of the sense of place is so important for a lot of Southeast Asian devs, mm -hmm. whether they want to like um, place it directly in front of players or whether they want to embed it like uh, slightly more subtly. Uh, mm -hmm. There just seems to be a larger narrative of like, we just want to see our culture is represented a lot more in the games, uh, in the games ecosystem. Let's talk about some of your favorite 
cozy and they don't have to be <laughs> officially cozy, but cozy and indie games yeah. that come from Southeast Asia. Take me through your faves. I think you know exactly. I actually like. I, I was. I was going to joke. I feel like you know most of the list. I think when we were going back and forth on this on this one, we uh, you mentioned some of the same names, but yeah. I'll, give, I'll <laughs> rattle off some of the obvious ones. And I think number one right now that I feel like everybody is aware of is Coral Island. Mm. So Coral Island, like I'm a big Stardew person. Like I started the update just dropped, and I'm ready to throw my entire life back yes, into Stardew. I'm right but there. Coral <laughs> Island was one of those ones where it came up uh, when Stardew wasn't particularly active if you will i know they they obviously like um because Dave obviously like does updates throughout but coral island was like kind of one of those stardew like games that mm-hmm. really 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 took off but that's a game yeah. from um you know an indonesian studio and so mm-hmm. uh stairway games are just made an amazing product they're constantly updating it the amount of content that's in that game is mind-blowing with every it's update mind that they also blowing. Produce. yeah um yeah, the level of quality is just like so insane. So yeah. that's like a household name that I would put out there. It's like Coral Island is an Indonesian game studio and they've made it big all around the world and I'm so excited and I'm so happy for them. Uh, yeah. So that's like obvious one, like knock out of the park, get out of the way. That game has a very special place in my heart too because when I first started making TikTok content, a video about Coral Island is my first video that ever went somewhat viral. It's my first video that had over 100,000 views. And it was probably my, like, I don't know, fifth, sixth, maybe tenth video or something. And when I first started making content, I wasn't really sure. I knew it was gaming, but I wasn't really sure exactly where I wanted to land. Like, I was kind of, like, I was thinking about making World of Warcraft content. I was playing that game a lot at the time. I was like, I don't really know where I want to land. And when my video about Coral Island went viral, I was kind of like, all right, let me make more content like that. And so then I started covering more and more cozy and indie games. So that game, besides just being That's an awesome. absolutely like stunner of a game, um, is very special to me. But you're you're right. That game has a ton of content. I mean, there's it filled maybe not a hole, but it, it was a people love Stardew and people wanted more games yeah. like that, right? And I feel like it was one of the first ones that came onto the scene that was a Stardew like game um, that was like really really good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. No, yeah. it checks all the boxes, right? Like you're, yeah. you're totally right and because there's some, some that come yeah. out that just like okay, I can see where you take inspiration here, but I still will mm-hmm. go back to playing Stardew. This one is like it ends up being a a completely different experience at the end of the day as well with how much they kind of like take the direction of that game but you're right it's Mm -hmm. just I don't know what is going on at Stairway Games like I don't know how big their team is I know a couple folks out there and like they're lovely people but it's more like I don't know what's going on in the water over there because what you guys are putting in this is just mind-blowing like with every update my two things on Coral Island before we move on is like uh, they did I remember when it came out for uh, a Kickstarter, if I'm not mistaken, they smashed their Kickstarter within mm-hmm. like, I think 24 hours or like 48 hours or something crazy like that. Yeah, And it, it was just fast. like came out of nowhere. And th- that was just awesome, like validation instantly. And then the second mm-hmm. thing about like embedding, uh, you know, culture into the game, again, it doesn't beat you over the head that it is very much an Indonesian game, but there's so many cool things. I think like we even covered it on our, on our podcast. There's like, uh, I think a friend actually told me that you can, there are durian in the game, which is like a very Southeast Asian household named Fruits. And Mm -hmm. also you can make durian wine or some fermented like aspects from the durian, just like any other uh, crop or plant or whatever. But it's those little touches where like, Stardew might have like a durian in there eventually or like whatever, but it just means so much more to have a lot more things that are normal to our part of the world Mm -hmm. in those games. And to have other people kind of experience that is just the most beautiful thing for me. So major love to them for creating an international smash hit like success, but also having some aspects of culture to like, you know, that speaks to the people in the region or the people that are familiar with the region. Yeah. And and what I love about Coral Island's story is I think that the, the the cultural pieces that they put into the game is what got people like partially what got people really excited about the game it was so different than some of the stuff like the all the other farming sims that um are out there right it added this very um unique touch just like gorgeous and yeah so i think that's definitely one of the things that really captured people um is like the, the cultural elements that they put in there too Another one that I wanted to bring up with you, let's get like the ones that we're familiar with out of the way, right? Is you brought it up earlier, but Potion Permit is like um, another game to me that is also made in uh, Indonesia by Mass Hive uh, Media, Mass Hive Games. And Mm -hmm. that is a game that 
floored me when I saw the trailer and when I ended up um, beta testing that game, where mm -hmm. uh, essentially it's a, a farming... I mean, how would you describe it? It's kind of like a riff off of a farming... Yeah, like, so... Life sim, village sim? I don't know. Yeah, like, the... Work your magic, the, you got this. The genre that I like to say is town game, which I heard somewhere, I don't remember where, but town game is basically any game where you move to a new town and you, you start a life there. So farm sims usually fall under town games, but town games can also encompass things beyond just farming so yeah potion permit you're not farming but you're uh, working as the chemist which is like the the doctor kind of and so you're doing a lot of similar things that you do in like a farm sim but not farming but you are gathering resources you're crafting and then one of the main things that you're doing each day is making potions and stuff like that to help the people that are sick in the town exactly and that one's really addicting it's gorgeous as well and yeah. i love the gameplay of it because it's both like there's the action combat stuff and the collecting side of things mm -hmm. and then you come back and brew your potions mm -hmm. um but that game was just such a special one because again that has like less quote-unquote indonesian culture in it but it's just made by developers that are from this region that are just looking to make the best games ever right so yeah. less so about the cultural aspect and less so on the representation aspect but a lot more so of the like do not underestimate developers that are coming from this region uh, kind of a scenario because that one i remember that was showcased at the wholesome games uh showcased mm -hmm. a couple years ago too and then since then i know they picked up uh yeah pkeep is a publisher and then they've just been kind of like running away with I, look i even think they launched on ios like last month as well oh so, really like, i didn't know they're that. just uh yeah i'm just really glad that that game for them i think it's it might be their debut game, if I'm not mistaken, or one of their early games. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so beautiful to see that uh, that game hit its hit its niche, hit its uh, success in that way. Yeah, that was another one where the art style grabbed me from the beginning as well. It's obviously very different than Coral Island, but like because it has it's a pixel art style. But I just the way that that it's like some of the most gorgeous pixel art that I've ever seen. The way that the characters, if your character has long hair, the way that your character's the hair sweat, yeah, flows absolutely. when you I run, exactly I could, I could watch it all day. And then the, the light, the way that the light shines out from uh, lamps and stuff like that is just really good and you have a dog that follows you around, oh yeah so absolutely. winner you can pet like... at any time and like find npcs absolutely i yeah, mean it's a funny yeah. one on like the magic of this game because i think we're we're very much in love with this one and for those that haven't played or listening to this like go play potion permit that's an oh, awesome yeah. game uh, sure. but like there was this like not controversy if you will but like uh Gen like hoyaverse like i think there's a genshin update that came out a couple weeks ago and it looks like they literally ripped off the potion building like resource and tetris style gameplay really? of potion yeah. permit so I know a lot of Indonesian devs. I know like Chris, the CEO of Toge, tweeted it. Like um, again, uh, Adika. I mean, I mean the potion permit like dev uh, the potion permit accounts like made a fun joke about like well i guess if, if it's good for genshin it's good for us or some, something along oh. those lines right <laughs> but it literally yeah. looked like the hoyaverse developers saw that game and took that mechanic and put it in uh, a hoyaverse game which again wow. i'm not trying to start flames or i'm not i'm not trying to start like fires of like ip rights or you know originality in, in games or whatever but it just goes to show that like a lot of people forget that independent games are the genesis of innovation and independent games are the genesis of um, successful mechanics as well Absolutely. that often go into AAA where not to say that the creative side on AAA is like sty stymied or whatever have you, but clearly a lot of great things that come from indies end up like uh, finding their way to AAA. So potion permit, I just want to like, if anybody's playing, I think it's Genshin, it could be uh, Star Rail, uh, but that they're, just find those tweets like people are tweeting about how it's so similar to push and permits mechanic that came out like two mm. plus years ago another game that i really wanted to bring up on this one and lay at this point you just let me know when to start and stop because i could also <laughs> rattle off like 10 other games that are coming out for like that have come out from you know it's like i'll talk about quiz in here i'll talk about when the pastors around i'll talk about i'll pause on when the pastors around because i've talked about it to death because i love that game it's so but, good uh, i'm literally staring i said this on my podcast but like i i'm literally staring at my when the pastors around giant desk mat that i got from um, rena the artist and it's my favorite thing i've ever purchased but i just want to share my story about when the past was around because that game was transformative to my content and it's also one of the mm -hmm. reasons why i continued covering southeast asian games where the character at the end of the game wears like a kabaya which is kind of like a local dress uh, outfit if you will mm -hmm. um and it's so recognizable that I think anybody who sees that character design knows that that's from the Southeast Asian region or Indonesia specifically. And for me, when I got to the end of When the Past Was Around, outside of how beautiful that game is and the meaning of that game and how momentous that story and that ending and that climax was, I bawled and like cried my eyes out because I thought about my family. 
You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. where it's like my sister is my mom, like the women that are that I grew up with like would wear similar types of like outfits right and for me it was just such a weird moment where like obviously you it's a really emotional ending but it just like punched me in the face of like that's what representation is you know it's yeah. not about shoving it in your face it's about these subtle things where you feel seen and your mm. culture and the things that you grew up with is represented in a thing that you're experiencing for the first time that has gone out to the world so when the past was around is one of my favorite games of all time it's a very important game for me but it's one of those ones where it it, that game without that game I would not be covering like working with Gamescom Asia working with Ludonericon working with like whatever accomplishments that I may have in the games ecosystem since starting content would not have occurred uh, without when the past was around so I love that game so wow. much wow that's awesome thank you for sharing that That that's beautiful now I'm gonna go play the game again now I'm thinking like super, about it yeah. I'm like man because it's been like a couple it's been at least a year since I played the game probably two years so I'm like I gotta go back I gotta play it again now it's it's beautiful <laughs> so beautiful I mean like when I say beautiful I mean like artistically but then also the story of it is just so it's so beautiful and then the, the way that it, the story unfolds I mean you're not yeah you're not told this happened and then this happened and then this happened and this is what's going on. You, you really experience it through all of the different, you know, levels and all of the different scenes that unfold. And yeah, it's, it's wow. And I mean, maybe yeah. the last one I want to spend some time on for like this section before I can obviously again, rattle off like 16 <laughs> other games that are uh, from Southeast Asia, but fit within that like kind of cozy realm is um, I think a, a dev that might go a little bit under the radar for people that are not in the region, uh, but this developer called Kayalan Arts, uh, and they're currently, I think, gaining traction for a game called I Need Space. Uh, and it's like this little 2D kind of like astronaut that goes from planet to planet. And it's like this really mm -hmm. interesting circular gravity I don't know. Just just look up the trailer. I'm not, I'm not describing it in any like <laughs> justice whatsoever. Uh, but their first game, Samudra, was really interesting. It's less cozy. It's a lot more like limbo and inside and things like that. Oh, but okay, okay. the reason why I want to bring up this developer as it relates to maybe some of your content, Lee, is that like they're not just a game developer. They do a lot of advocacy as well as uh, projects that further sustainability and I think like general uh, positive externality like in the world. So ocean cleanups, like recycling mm. projects, uh, but a lot of that stuff is also represented in their game. So Samudra is also a game that's set underwater and there's a lot of concepts like ideas of pollution and how that affects uh, the waters, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I know Coral Island also touches on some similar things, but again, it's quite fascinating to talk about these devs and these games because I Need Space looks really fun and wacky because it's like space and you're trying to find your, I think you're a cat called Nebula. You're either trying to find the cat or the cat like follows you around. I don't exactly Aww. remember. L, please don't suit, like, please don't find me for representing <laughs> your game. Um, but, uh, but I just want to talk about the dev side of things where uh, there are some devs from the region that recognize that there are issues that are impacting the Southeast Asian region that we mm -hmm. feel like we need to speak up about and be an active like force for change of. And some of those devs uh, bring that into their games just like Kayalan Arts does with not just their games, but also the larger studio as a whole. Um, so it's just beautiful to see. And I know this relates to... Um, a Space for the Unbound because A Space for the Unbound has been nominated for a lot of like social impact awards as well talking mm -hmm. about like mental health but then I know one of my favorite discussions and I know it's really dark but like one of the most memorable discussions I had last year about games was when we, when we had Michael Heim from GameSpot formerly of GameSpot on our podcast talking about um, A Space for the Unbound and just talking about like the forms of like mental and physical abuse that seem more prevalent here in Southeast Asia you know, or like the ways that you kind of showcase that aspect in a Southeast Asian context. Um, mm -hmm. Just, yeah, like you can tell that there's a Southeast Asian touch to some of these topics that are really important all over the world, um, but are conveyed in a, in a way that is very local, if you will. So yeah. I don't know. I just wanted to mention the dev side of things, some serious side of things as well. Like, although there are yeah. a lot of cozy, a lot of positive uh, games that are out there, like the power of games doesn't stop with just, uh, the product at the end of the day like there's so much more impact mm -hmm. that can be made um, from games or from studios can you speak on more on like what some of those are and, and how they show up in in some games yeah I mean I don't know I feel like the pollution one is kind of like the obvious one for a lot yeah. of devs so like it's mm -hmm. like Coral Island like Kayalan Arts there's a lot of stuff like that but I think we're entering in a, a different 
tone of the Southeast Asian Games region, where you've seen runaway hits like Coffee Talk, like Coral Island. I mean, the one that I always uh, bring up that people don't know is from Singapore is um, Cat Quest, right? Like the Cat Quest mm. series is devs from like three devs from Singapore. Like love wow. the team out there. They're so elusive and they never want to do our interviews, but whenever we get them on, they're just so they're the one, most wonderful people in the world. But like. Um, there, there's obviously success in the region, but actually, I think to answer your question, like without answering your question, is like I think there are more stories to tell from the region mm -hmm. that people are now realizing that they're able to tell because of the success of these games. Where maybe beforehand it might have been uh, hesitant to showcase like culture or things that are going on, but I think now people are willing to take some of those chances. Um, yeah. I think. Just recently, I know After Love EP, which is a really fascinating one because it's also made for, by an Indonesian studio, but the director of the game passed away. He was also the art director of Coffee Talk, Fami. And mm -hmm. that game went on hiatus for a long time, but I know there, the team who was originally working on it is coming back to try to finish off that game and try to make sure that that game releases. Um, again, it's set in Jakarta, but I know it has a lot to say about, uh, you know, potentially mental health, but also heartbreak and relationships and all that kind of stuff. So all these things, again, I think just to tie it back to social issues, like the social issues and, you know, all, you know, whether it be geo, whether it be environment, whether it be yeah, social, political, whatever have you, right? Like all of those issues in Southeast Asia are experienced by people all around the world. But right. to be able to have any of those issue, issues touched by a Southeast Asian developer, I think gives it an extra finesse. The one thing that yeah. I'll give an example for that's not from the Southeast Asian region is Venba. Like again, Venba, another runaway hit success from this past year. And that yeah. game is so simple. It's literally like a couple levels long. It's cooking. You don't, you get the family dynamic, but no matter what kind of family you were brought up with, there's some forms of like relatability there, but there's mm -hmm. like an extra level of like detail that I've had conversations with my friends about the way that that character tech their parents you know what I mean and oh, it's yeah, so yeah. Asian coded and it's just one of those things where it's like these aren't larger social issues that need to be addressed per se right but these uh -huh. are more down to earth cultural moment to moment things that relate to everybody but there's an extra level of detail that when you know you're from a region or when you know you're from a culture or if you're an immigrant and you're overseas or all that kind of stuff like it speaks to you it speaks to those people right so I'm just yeah. really excited games are, be able, are able to speak to different people all around the world, um, whether it be they be from one region or not. Are there any other games that you want to talk about that are already out? Cuisineer that came out from Singapore is one that I feel like uh, I just need to mention because I played that game on like my Steam Deck so so many hours. I'm like, just like over and over and over again. But it's one of those, mm -hmm. again, cooking, uh, I don't know, dungeon, Hades-like, roguelike kind of like elements, but I just love yeah. what the art style that they built on there. So I think the people who are fans of that art style, fans of those characters need to check out a game like Cuisineer. Speaking of like cooking games, and maybe this also comes to, I'm just going to morph them all into one, like, where it's like some upcoming games as well. So there's this game called Set Up that is also from Singapore, and they're basically doing somewhat of an overcooked, like a, a rendition of Overcooked, where you have to hunt for the food and then deliver it to your other player that cooks the food as well. But it's all mostly Southeast Asian dishes as well. Oh, uh, and cool. they've got a really interesting, cool mechanic. Just look up the trailer. I think it's really awesome and dynamic. But those are like kids that uh, came out of a university project, right? And oh, wow. uh, they're, you know, looking for publishers and they're trying to get, take the game to the next level. But they just started their social uh, uh, like pages as well, and they're so Gen Z about it, and they're so great with their videos. It's just Hilarious. popping off. So like, nice. go go check out the uh, set up team from uh, from Singapore as well. Um, uh, otherwise, I mean, like, it's quite interesting because not so much on the cozy side, but I think a lot of devs are experimenting with, like, less cozy <laughs> games, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, or even, see, like, like, genre blends, like, things that are somewhat cozy, but then are also not cozy, you know? Yeah. like so I know there's some, some games coming out from the region that, that, like, like you said, genre blend or whatever have you. But one of the funniest stories is, like, you know, the folks behind... Um, you know, uh, Coffee Talk and uh, uh, Space for the Abound, all that kind of stuff. They're like, they had a joke internally where, like, our, all our new games are really violent and really dark. So if you look <laughs> at, like, um, I think Whisper Mountain Outbreak is one under Toge Productions, and that one is, like, zombie, but survival zombie, and it's fun and quirky, but it's still, like, very violent. It's like, whoa, where the heck did this come from? From like, yeah. the Coffee Talk developers? Um, and, like, Crease Front Tactics is another one under that company that is coming out. It's like a mecha, like, tactics sim. Um, I know there's some, uh, there's an amazing game coming out from the Philippines. These are a bunch of games that are coming out um, 
that are also showcased on larger platforms as well that are all coming from the Southeast Asian region. Uh, there's Ode Ode that's coming out too from the Metronomic team here in Malaysia. That one is like, again, the, I don't know if they're indie indie. They're definitely like on the higher end of indie because they came from AAA backgrounds, but that's also like seems to be a cute kind of very artistic yet very cultural um, game that is going nice. to be coming out. But honestly, like at, at this point, just, not like I would say like follow my content but just start paying attention to Southeast Asian developers because once mm -hmm. you start following folks like Tokyo Productions you're going to end up following folks like Copy Forge and then you're going to end up following folks like Gentle Brews and then after that you're going to be following folks from XYZ Development Studio so mm -hmm. um, just pay attention to the region and I'm sure great games will come at you uh, swinging I also want to give love to developers who work with creators and developers who work with uh um, I guess like larger institutions. So the two mm -hmm. projects that I just want to quickly name is um, number one, you know, we've been working with Gamescom Asia for the past two years to do a, a showcase on Southeast Asian games. So to have support from, you know, Gamescom and Gamescom Asia to do that kind of showcase shows a lot of commitment on their side to, you know, again, talk about games from the region. So basically what we do is like we host it alongside Virtual C. So the 20th podcast and Virtual Southeast Asia kind of co-host this show at Gamescom Asia every single year where we interview devs and then we show trailers for games that are either out or come out. And then on top of that, over on the 20th podcast, me and my podcast co-host um, did the Malaysia Direct last year. And that's mm -hmm. a riff on the Nintendo Direct. It's a lot more intimate. It's a bit more national oriented for Malaysian games. But all this to say that like we've been seeing, you know, I personally as a creator and like a person who consumes all the stuff Stuff, and I, I know you do as well, right, Lay? But it's like, there's so many showcases coming out that have a bunch of different niches. And I actually think it's all positive for the ecosystem because it helps mm -hmm. speak and find that audience. So major love to the developers that try to get their work out there, but also major love for the people, whether you be from larger institutions or content creators or media who cover independent games and cover Southeast Asian games, right? Because without yeah. that, that loop, um, I, I don't I, I don't know I refuse to have the only solution to get your game out there be like you know two million dollars in marketing spend you know like that's yeah. that's like really messed up like we should find other avenues to make sure that these games get uh, shown to the right people in the right ways and um, in creative ways as well and also shout out to everyone who consumes content about indie games like everybody listening right now taking the initiative to like go out and learn about all the amazing games that are coming out is is also awesome. The, the viewers, the players, and all of the community members on all over the internet are like so instrumental in that as well, which is, it's just a lovely little ecosystem, isn't it? Isn't it a nice, like, I love, I love the interaction between developers and creators and players and it's just, it's nice. I yeah, like and I mean, like that's the reason why we got connected, right? It's just like, like you yeah. said, maybe through that more like Coral Island, but all that that niche of video games is kind of like the stuff that I love consuming anyway. So when I find creators or when I find people that speak the same language or like the same things, like you just want to follow those people, you want to be around those people. So mm -hmm. this is a funny full circle moment, I guess, uh, like because I think your content is awesome. I'm honored to be here, but it's just like, look, you're preaching the good word on cozy, amazing independent games that people might. Uh, have missed looked right or like they yeah. they've missed uh on on their feeds or whatever have you so you're doing you're doing amazing work as well well thank you thank you where, where can everybody find you on the internet you could just look up uh at rf johan like you'll find me on whatever platform like at this point except for tiktok i'm at uh rf underscore johan because some dude has rf johan it, it doesn't matter it's a sore it's a sore topic how rude for me. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but uh yeah but but most honestly like i mean follow the 20m podcast because like i know that's the reason why i love this show because i you know we were talking about like loving long form so if you are mm. looking for more long form videos and specifically maybe i'll shout out like some interview ones that we did so we did one with uh, uh, Jared J10 from Devolver Digital. So he did a lot of the Cult of the Lamb early social oh, content. So Jared was on our podcast. Yeah. So that was a great episode, deep diving into like what it means to be like uh, content, like doing content uh, for a game like that. Uh, but then also we like had one with uh, voice actors as well. So Su Ling from um, uh, Malaysian Talent, who's been in a lot of other like projects, including uh, a Hoyo game uh, for Star Rail, is just like some of the deep dives that we do alongside some platform folks and some other media folks that we collaborate with but again all that to say like follow the 20m podcast but also follow any folks who are collaborating and giving voice to the games industry um not just like at panels not just at like industry events but like anybody who's making sure devs show their faces and devs like show their either share their voices if you will to mm -hmm. me that's like my larger mission in games like just start listening to content or watching content that showcase the developers as well not just yes. um, 
the games that you play because obviously the games that we all play are flipping awesome but get to know the people behind them it's uh just makes the world a little bit better i think well thank you so much this has been so amazing i appreciate you and um this was really really great thanks for coming on yeah, thanks. Like, honestly, again, thanks so much for having me. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the work that you do and the content, but like this is such a cool, 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 cool moment. So um, just honored, blessed. What great content. I feel like a celebrity being invited onto this thing. Like this is oh like the gosh. David Letterman show for me. This is like, you are Conan O'Brien to me, right? <laughs> the Conan of cozy games. <laughs> <laughs>